Welcome. Listen, we have an awesome show for you today with our guest, Angela Harrington Rice, the Renaissance woman. But first, you all know I like to start with a quote. So our quote to today is, every Renaissance comes to the world with a cry, the cry of the human spirit to be free. And that's from Ann Sullivan. And this is exactly what our guest is doing today. She's helping to free the human spirit, spirit with her um, through television, through her books, and through her ministry. you certainly are a renaissance woman and i'd like for you to tell us what inspired you to create widow wings <laughs> well what inspired me was probably one of the most devastating um things in my life uh, my husband made his transition march 24th um 2014 and i was just devastated I was devastated. I just thought my world had just fallen apart. I couldn't see myself going on. Um, everything was empty. Nothing brought me joy. And I guess you could say I was I was pretty much depressed. And I looked for help and was unable to find it. Um, I reached out to people who admonished me for feeling the way I was feeling because, you know, if you are a Christian, you're not supposed to mourn, you're not supposed to grieve. Um, and I have to remind them that Jesus wept. <laughs> and so, um, and so mm. I kept looking, you know, I was even told things like, you know, don't, um, um, don't cry, you're, you're a minister, you know, it, it doesn't look good. I mean, all kinds of things. And, so finally, uh, on the internet, which I consider sometimes my best friend, on the internet, I found this organization called Camp Widow. And I went to a um, a camp in Tampa, Florida. And everyone who was a part of that organization was either a widow or a widower. And so it was so comfortable because you knew what the other person felt. Um, you don't know exactly their feelings, but you knew that they had lost someone important. Um, you knew it was okay for us to cry. So we cried together. Mm. We shared our stories. Um, there were persons there to minister to us in terms of um, sharing some healing modalities that um, they thought would help us. And so I just felt so at home and so comfortable. And it was the first time I felt like I was getting some relief. So when I came back to Atlanta, mm -hmm. um, I thought, oh, this would be a great opportunity or I could feel a need for people um, in Atlanta, the women who had lost their significant others. And the interesting thing was that it, it was a help for me. I think I needed to find women who had shared similar yes. experiences. And so, and so I started this group on the, um, June 25th, 2015, which is um, my wedding anniversary. And um, I think one person showed up, but I kept doing it until others showed up. And um, it was wonderful having these women to talk. We shared our stories about our husband. We shared how they um, made their transition. We shared our feelings and we connected with one another. Um, and so, and we're still connected to this day, the, the, the first group. And so over the years, um, it will be, I think what, I don't know, I'm not going to count in my head, but it's been, um, a few years now that we have continued, um, to go forward with the organization. Um, one of the things is just, I learned so much through my own experience at Camp Widow and all of the reading that I've done. And recently, um, I became a, uh, a licensed grief coach. And so one of the things that I know is that it is important to talk about it. Um, sometimes people don't want to talk because yes. 
They think that no one wants to hear the story. And so when you come to Widow Wings, when you're a part of that, uh, we know what the story, you know, we know we're going to hear your story and we want to hear your story. We want to listen. And so we want to comfort mm -hmm. and share. And it's a wonderful place where um, you can cry and no one is going to tell you to stop crying. Um, you, we're just going to be there for you. Um, we talk about things. It sounds that like a do. safe place. Oh, it is. It, it is a like very a safe, safe place. place. Yes. We don't, we don't want no judgment. You know, we just want people mm -hmm. to come for the healing and for the love that we want to share with them. So it's been, um, it's been a journey. Um, there are some women who swear I saved their lives. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. I, you know, I would have never wanted to be this, never wanted to, 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 um, to begin a widow's group or any of that, you know, but when things come into your life, I think, you know, sometimes it gives you direction to help others. You know, I think about mothers who lost their children, you know? Yes. I feel so alone. So, yeah. So I've been doing that and really find it very rewarding. Angela, there were so many things that you touched on. Um, you know, 2020, you know, now we're into a new year. A lot of people are trying to leave the baggage of 2020 behind, right? But Angela, so many people lost loved ones, mothers, I mean, children, grandparents, some, some folks lost multiple people due to COVID. Yeah. And just as a minister, um, like, I, I mean, you know, how do you talk to someone who lost a loved one due to COVID when a lot of people feel like they really didn't have to lose their loved one, you know? And so how, how do you help them grieve with this and starting a new year and trying to start over you know, what advice do you give to them? And it's a couple other things that you touched on too that I want to, I have a question about that I'm coming back to that, but well, that's my first the, question. One of the things that happen with most people who lose someone is they go through a sense of guilt. And even though COVID may have been the reason um, or something related to COVID may have been a, a reason for death, a lot of times, even their loved ones will say, I shouldn't have taken them to the hospital uh, when they got the cough. I should have looked at it more seriously. So we have this feeling of guilt. And so one of the things um, is working toward releasing the guilt of why the person died or how the person died. Um, and in terms of you know COVID and recognizing that our government did not do all that it needed to do to protect its citizens, I think sometimes activism is a response to that. You know, how do we, um, how do we bring this government um, to a, a, a point of reconciliation, um, really talking about what happened? And a lot of times that happens in groups. Um, so I would suggest that people who know of others who have experience um, losing a loved one um, because of COVID um, to gather, to gather and to mourn together, to talk about um, the challenges and support each other. Uh, and then we, we memorialize those who have, uh, who lost their lives to COVID, you know, by remembering them. You know, mm -hmm. there are many memorials for those who died in the war. There are memorials for those who, um, you know, died in 9-11. Um, so mm -hmm. think about ways in which we can memorialize um, the lives of those who were lost, even if it's just a, a family ceremony, a way of remembering. But we really have to just bit by bit release you know, bit by bit release. Um, and one of the things that I would suggest that um, people do, um, no matter what is the reason of death, is to write. 
journaling is such an effective tool um, for those who are going through grief. Writing down your feelings, writing down memories of the person um, that you lost, writing letters to God, writing letters to Jesus mm -hmm. or, or whoever um, you consider your, your savior or um, your, your guiding spirit in this world. Writing down these things, those um, small steps, although they seem really small, can be really um, healing for, for you. So think yes. about how can I remember? What can I do? What can I establish in my family? What can I establish in my community? Um, what did that person leave us or those persons leave us um, so that we can continue to move forward? And that's one of the things we don't want to get stuck. And getting stuck, um, many people don't know this, but um, grief comes with a lot of physical challenges. Many persons who do not deal with their grief effectively um, will also experience some physical challenges. After mm -hmm. my husband died, um, I was diagnosed with high blood pressure. Never had high blood pressure before, but now I have high blood pressure and it's, mm. and it's the stress of it all. So we have mm -hmm. to find ways to relieve stress. You know, as I said, running, um, writing, um, praying, um, really your spirituality will really um, guard you well, you know? Um, and one of, one of the greatest healers, one of the greatest healers is nature. Taking time to walk in nature, um, to sit in nature, to commune in nature, um, mm. reading positive, um, inspirational um, books, reading the Bible, reading um, other books. There are some wonderful books that are on grief. And I know that um, once um, the COVID starts to subside, we will see many ceremonies um, actually bringing people together to honor those who have lost their lives to, to COVID. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things, um, although I do Widow Wings, I'm also a, um, a certified grief coach. And so I have been working on ideas with others about how we can bring the community together um, to celebrate the lives of those who um, are gone on because of COVID and to help encourage the spirits of those that they um, that remain behind. So those and are just some yeah. thoughts about um, how do we manage um, the COVID and the deaths related to COVID. Angela, those are some great points. I mean, those things that a lot of people don't think about while they're experiencing them, especially your health, how grief yes. and stress can affect your health. So can you tell us, Angela, a little about One Love Spiritual Center? Well, One Love, um, and it relates back to my husband. And as I talked about um, creating memorials to your loved ones, um, my husband was diagnosed with brain cancer and um, given a short time to, um, to live. And so it was... One day we were coming home from one of his doctor's appointments and he said <laughs> in the car as we're at the light, he says, we don't have much time. We have to start our church, which was interesting mm. because my husband was not a real church going man. And so, you know, I thought about that and then, you know, I kind of discarded it, put it away uh, because at the time it was, you know, his health was the most important thing. And, um, and he started to decline. So we didn't think much more about his statement of starting um, this church. And then um, the first anniversary of his death, I had a memorial service for my husband. Although we had a, you know, a memorial service, you know, immediately after he died a couple of weeks. But, you know, I like to commemorate every year. You know, I will gather his family, friends, and we will do something to call his name. And in African cosmology, they say as long as your um, as long as your loved one's name is called, that person does not die. He's still in our consciousness and in our hearts. So I did a service for him, and um, then someone said, "Well, why don't you do this again?" 
And I was like, oh, okay. And, and more other people said that. And then uh, I think a year later, I said, you know, maybe I will. Maybe I'll honor his request. And so I started um, in a little house in Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. And it was a beautiful service. Um, um, Jewel had an opportunity to come and speak to us once. Yes. And so uh, since that time, we moved from place to place. And now we're in this COVID <laughs> era and trying to figure out what to do next. But one of the things that we base our services on is love. Um, so we're not much into dogma. We're not much into, um, you know, telling people what they should or should not do. But we are into loving people, talking about, because Jesus, you know, there were 600 or more laws, Jewish laws. And Jesus said, it all comes down to love. It all comes down to love. And so that's what we try to do. We try to have messages that are loving, um, try to support each other. And our services when we were meeting in person were pretty much like the services Jesus would have known because people didn't meet in churches. They met in people's homes and they would have a celebration, a message, they would read some scripture and then they would eat. And that's what we did <laughs> when we were meeting. <laughs> so we are working on developing um, the ministry online until we can get back where we can really hug each other and love each other and and continue to you know build um the kingdom of god through love yes amen angela ever since um i've known you um in in terms of the field of television and producing even when you hosted your show a woman's place you've you've always everything that you've ever done you've always used it as a tool to minister right to really help people and to be that life coach and i i just wanted to know um how you have been able to continue to just be able to just grow and strive no matter what the challenge is because it seems like you're always putting out to other people but how do you spend that time to refocus yourself and then to be able to give back to folks especially after you've been ministering to them and guiding them and teaching them and encouraging them that is one of the big challenges jewel <laughs> <laughs> I cannot tell you that I do that very well. Sometimes I go, 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 and then I just can't go any longer. And one day I was talking to a friend and I told her my plate was, uh, my, uh, yeah, my plate was full. And she said, oh, you don't have a plate. You have a platter. <laughs> <laughs> True. So, yes. so as I go into this new year, I've been talking to myself about scheduling me on my calendar. You know, mm -hmm. I put everything else on my calendar and I end up with what's left over. So um, my New Year's resolution uh, or my intention for the year is to put my put me on the calendar, you know, to do the things yes. that, um, that I like to do, to do those things that um, replenish me. And, and when I say put me on the calendar, I'm not talking about my prayer time because that's on the calendar every day, you know. Right. I'm going and my reading and my meditating. That's that's God's time. But Angela needs some time. <laughs> so I said, you know, I'm not a real girly girl, you know. Um, so I said, you know, maybe I'm gonna make sure I get my nails and you know, done instead of mm -hmm. doing it myself. Let me do that, you know. So let me put things that I like to do. Like I like bowling. I haven't found anybody to bowl with, but I was like, Do you like I bowling? I like bowling. Okay, I I was on the bowling team and oh, no. in middle school and yeah, nails and all, nails and all. Wow. I would bowl. So, so that's what we gonna do. We need to hook up and 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 do some bowling. Get all that tension out, you know, I on know. those pins. I know. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, you know, I remember how my parents, you know, they worked hard, but they played hard baseball you know, bowling, they would have card night, you know, it was all these things that they enjoyed doing. And I find myself just, you know, I'm in school too, working on an MDiv. So 
It's like between wow. between school and um, all these other things that I do. That the only time I seem to have for me is when I sleep. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I am planning on the new year to 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 make a turn. Yes. Well, An- Angela, through your interfaith community initiative, the ICI. Tell us about your travels to several to the several countries that you visited and the relationships that you uh, established there. Well, you know, it is really wonderful. We have been, um, the end of last year, we had a reunion um, for all of the trips that we had um, sponsored. We had 27 um, pilgrimages to different countries. Wow. Yeah. And so we had all of these groups come back and share, you know, what their experience, what they had learned. Um, and, and so that was really wonderful to hear, um, everybody realize how important it is for people to come together across, um, racial and religious lines. And the interesting thing about the trips that we create is that the country is just a backdrop. It really has very little to do with the country. What our whole intention is, is that the people who go on the trip will get to know each other. So mm-hmm. there's a special yes. design to the trip. Once one, um, you have to be with a different person of a different faith or culture each day. So you can't just get, you can't just go with friends and just hang out with friends. You got to go with somebody different. So you get to know different people. Um, our international yes. trips are usually about 10 days. And so during that 10 days, you are hanging out with different people. Then the other thing is every third night, you have to get a different roommate. So it was oh, really wow. funny to hear people talk really? about um, Christians talking about they're trying to sleep and the Muslim gets up like at 5 a.m. and pray. And the interesting yeah. thing from that is that the Christian becomes more committed because they saw the Muslim getting up so early to pray. And then one said he uh, wasn't rooming with a Muslim, but a Buddhist and the Buddhist got up at 430. So, <laughs> so you know, so we learn a lot about people of different faiths during our trips. Um, so that is one of the wonderful things. And, and of course we love going to the, um, the different um, sites when we go on international travel. One of the things is that we also worship um, in different traditions while we're there. So mm-hmm. we go to a Muslim Juma, which is their prayer service that's usually held on Friday. Um, we go to Shabbat with the Jews, which is usually a Friday evening prayer. And then um, we have a Christian service where we either go into a church in the, of the place that we're visiting or we create a Christian service um, ourselves. So it's always, it's, it's beautiful. My favorite, I love Turkey, would love to go back to Turkey. Right now yes. they're having a lot of challenges, kind of like we're having in this country. Yes. Yeah. But we did one, and I know Jewel knows how much I'm into getting women together. And so I was one of the orchestrators of the women's only journey to San Francisco. We started off with a mud bath in Calistoga, which is in the wine country of California. So, And so every time I hear that they're having a fire in Calistoga or in, in Northern California, you know, it hurts my heart because that was a very special time for us, um, you know, going to the mountains, going, um, doing the, bud, uh, the mud bath and, and just enjoying it, you know. Yeah, it, I tell you, um, I was so um, pleased to be able to have journey to Turkey and yeah. have that experience. And uh, uh, Dino actually had a chance to go to Turkey as well when he was a principal. Am I correct about that? Your student won an art contest? Yeah. Dino, is it? Mm-hmm. Yes. It was so exciting. I know it's such a beautiful place and it's so, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's beautiful. And I enjoy 
every little um, place that we went and, and really had a really great time learning about the different faiths and, and yes. the politics that had created what we know as Turkey today. And, and I got a chance to be a part of a service at Ephesus. Isn't wow. That? Yeah, yeah. I, was, I did the call to worship. In oh wow! Yeah, that was really a treat. I was like, "Oh my goodness!" <laughs> that and that was a that was a beautiful place to be able to go. Like you see, they take you to the burial grounds of Mary. You know, the mother mm -hmm. of Jesus. While you're there, and um, going to Ephesus. yeah, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. And now. For those who don't know, if I didn't mention it earlier, you also, what was this, in 2008, you also received an Emmy for the documentary, um, uh, A Pilgrimage Journey yeah. to Turkey, right? So, yes. yeah, so how did, I mean, I mean, how did that, um, how did that come about? And, and like I said, again, you, you got an Emmy for that, for yeah. that documentary. Well, the um, president of AIB was invited to go to Turkey um, to learn more about interfaith because he had come from corporate. And mm -hmm. um, so they wanted to give him an idea of, you know, the people in the interfaith community, people he could make contacts with. Um, but he chose me to go instead of going. And so one of the things he said, okay, um, bring back footage. So I brought back footage and and then um, I was like, oh, what am I going to do with all this? You know, <laughs> I'm recording things. And then I recognized because I'm really not a videographer. I mean, I, I just swear to that. But um, I took <laughs> I took I know the a, a <laughs> decent footage, I guess, that we could use. And then um, I interviewed um, the persons who went on the trip. So they came into the studio and um, shared um, their ideas and their reflections. And so um, the wonderful wizard known as Sharon Phillip. Um, yes, you know, who, who happens to be behind the scenes of this podcast for those around the world who don't know. Just yeah. <laughs> so we partnered together. I put together a script. I gave her the script and, and she, she, she did wonderful things with it. And so um, we, um, AIB had never submitted for an Emmy before. Um, that was the first time. And wow. I have to give it to um, Kali Burnett, who was uh, president of AIB. He suggested that um, I submit it. You know, I really didn't think anything more of that. And then they said, you know, we were nominated. It's like, oh my goodness. And I'm going to yes. tell you, that was a major thing for AIB, which is a small um, network. Um, it's um, in the Atlanta area. And I don't think many organizations our size with the number of subscribers or um, viewers that we had had ever really um, received an accolade that big. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was amazing. And so Sharon and I went to the the ceremony. And um, so, yeah, I have it hanging. Well, I have it somewhere. Right <laughs> now. It's here. It's here. And then when I did the World Pilgrims reunion, um, you know, one of the things um, uh, one of the um, board directors said, show the people the image. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, so that's I was right. Really good. And I also wow. entered the Silver Circle, which is a uh, an accolade that they give people who've been in the industry for over um, 20, I think it was over 20 years, who have done significant work. So I was very proud of both of those achievements. Amazing. Do you know, Al, you had a question? You know, speaking, yeah. Speaking of awards, you've been inducted into the Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Ministries and Laity Board of Preachers at Morehouse College. Speak out about that honor. Oh, yeah, that was exciting. That was exciting. Um, accepting the award from um, the Martin Luther King International Chapter means that we commit to upholding the upholding the, the truth about Dr. Martin Luther King and his mission. So we work to make sure that 
you know, we are continuing to follow in the steps uh, in the steps of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So I found that to be mm -hmm. a very um, rich and rewarding um, award. Um, so many people are our members, um, and so I was I was just elated to be um, accepted um, to go through the ceremony and to make that commitment to furthering the work of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I think if anyone is a minister, what the work that he did is so important. And for me, Dr. Martin Luther King to me um, is probably closest to Jesus that I've known um, in terms of speaking out for the poor, um, speaking out for those who are disenfranchised, um, just and, and talking about the value uh, of peace and love. You know, a lot of times we look at some of the things that have happened in our country and it, it's so easy to hate. <laughs> it's so easy to hate. Yeah. And to think about the injustices that we have gone through, thinking about those who have died from COVID, thinking about how it was downplayed, thinking about how our democracy is being made a, 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 a joke. Um, just thinking about what we're going through and how there is so much tension and there is so much division. But Martin Luther King tells us that, you know, we can't reduce ourselves to hate. You know, even we got, as Jesus said, we yes. got to love those who um, persecute us, those who come against us. And it's through love that we can um, bring this country back to the, 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 um, the value that it had. And so I'm really proud to be a part of that. And yes. um, I've been really proud to see that our children have become more interested in the political process uh, and, and making good use of the vote <laughs> that yes. their ancestors have um, worked mm -hmm. for and died for and struggled for. Um, and so I, I believe that we have an opportunity now to to keep marching so that we can see the rights of everyone in this country um, upheld. Um, I think about those children who are still in cages. You know, yes. I mean, and so we have to we have to speak out. You know, we have to. I mean, Dr. King sacrificed so much. You know, I mean, house mm. blown. You know, yeah. somebody trying to kill him. Um, I mean, you just think about all of the stuff that he sacrificed um, so that we could have some of the freedoms that we have today, but we, we got to keep struggling and keep, keep marching. Keep, yes. Keep moving forward. Yes. Um, um, Angela, I, I, and I want to um, get before, you know, I see that we're running close out of time because yes. we're definitely going to have you back um, before I ask this question. I really want to just acknowledge um, Mr. Carlos name. And I just want to say his name in um, the atmosphere as you spoke about him, but you didn't mention his name. So we just speak the name of Mr. Carlos Rice and we just, you know, just want to recognize his name. Well, um, thank you. For, yes, yes, for all um, that he added to um, to everyone that knew him and that all that he gave you in your lifetime together that you all spent. Um, with all that you've been through, Angela, with you being the Renaissance woman, as we're talking about, and people are looking to just, just do awesome things um, this new year and move behind uh, 2020, tell us about your second book, Shaking Off the Dust. I think this is a wonderful book for people to get this year to just shake off the dust of 2020, look forward to 2021 and tell us about it and, and how this book came together. Well, I was a part of a, a writing group called Sister Scribes. For a long time, it didn't have a name. It was just, it was women who got together and we were supposed to write. All of us had aspirations of being authors. And so we got together and um, we would get together at each other's homes or restaurants. And what happened is that the group was supposed to be a writing group, but nobody was writing. 
We were eating good though. <laughs> we were eating and we were socializing and we were doing all of that. And one of our members um, made a passionate plea uh, for some something to happen in our group because we were just a social group. Nobody had published a book. So that's so she she dared me. So that's when I published my first book, Resurrecting the Lives. But then um, I thought, well, maybe if I challenge the other women in the group, you know, maybe we could work on a book together. And so what happened is the book came about because they weren't writing. We weren't writing. We were socializing. But then when we said we were going to write to publish, then there was more energy. And so the book is about, um, it's seven women who tell their stories of the dust um, that had held them back for a number of years and how they had to release that so they could move on. We have a story from one of the sisters who's about her brother who had mental illness, who was actually murdered by the police in New York. This happened in, in the oh, wow. 1990s. And so it reflects so much of what's going on. So, you know, when she hears these other stories, she she reflects back on what happened to her and her family. Uh, another um, person who talks about somewhat divorcing her parents, um, you know, because of domestic violence in the home. So, um, so there are stories mm -hmm. about um, people who went through these um, tragedies or these circumstances that kind of thwarted their, their freedoms, um, their spiritual freedom, their freedom to be whole. And they tell these stories and then they tell you how they overcame and how the dust is in the wind. <laughs> yes, I like that. And, and um, I know on a future date, we look to have some of those uh, authors I'm on so our good. show as well, coming <laughs> coming up in the near future. So, you know, I just want folks to be on the lookout for for uh, for that. Um, Angela, we need to be able to have you back whenever you have a renaissance man or woman on the show. It is so much to cover. It's hard to cover in just, oh, I know. you know, I know. just 30 minutes. But Angela, thank you so much you know, for joining us on Speak Out yes. World. We really, oh, really enjoy fun. having you. Thank you, Jewel. Uh, and we're going bowling, right, Jewel? Yes, we are going bowling. I'm, I yes. just I'll cut my nails a little bit down, but yeah, we're going bowling. I'm, I'm very competitive. I'm just going to let Angela, you know. So we'll get the team and, together. Angela, when you return, when you return, Angela, I want to know more about your forthcoming book, My Grandmother the Mystic. Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to talking about her. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Mr. D. Yes, and thank you, Jewel. And it was wonderful being here and much success on your podcast. And thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I just want to let everyone know again, that was Angela Harrington Rice, our topic of the Renaissance woman and a journey through her life. Um, if you want to get her book or contact Angela, Angela does speaking engagements, or you want to get your book, start off 2020 on a whole different clear path. And if you've been mourning and grieving, go visit her website at Angela HarringtonRice.com, and you can check out more by going to our podcast um, website as well. So check us out at SOWpodcast.com. That's soy SOWpodcast.com, and then you can find out more of that, or check us out on SpeakOutWorld.com. And if you'd like to be a guest, just send us an email, and um, we just want to remind you that you have a voice. So don't be afraid, Dino. Tell them what to do. Speak out world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's our show for today. Check you next time.